walks away after winning his 100th game as the head coach here at Notre Dame. The reason I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I was born in this country. It isn't what you have, it's what you're taught about the values of life. We're trying to save souls. Say there's a real life, but then you're either growing or you're dying. And like an old friend once said, we as Americans need to start winning again. Everyone should ask this question. Am I willing to endure the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice it takes to be a champion? Welcome to the Lou Holtz Podcast. We have a lot of great guests on this show, but I don't think we've ever had anyone more interesting who has accomplished as much or overcome so many obstacles as our guest today, Jack Brewer. Jack was raised in Grapevine, Texas, and serves as the chairman of the Jack Brewer Foundation and the chair of the Center for Opportunity Now and vice chair of the Center for the 76th. America First Policy Institute. Recently, Jack was advisory board member of Black Vote for Trump. In 2004, he started his own firm, the Brewer Group, which has served as chief executive officer and portfolio manager. He is a White House appointment of the Congressional Commission for the Social Status of the Black Man and Boys, a professor at Fordham Gabriel School of Business. Jack was a team captain of the NFL, Minnesota Vikings, New York Giants, and Philadelphia Eagles. Jack resides in Florida with his wife, Courtney, and his children. When you have somebody in on your show who you're enamored with, who you're so impressed of all the things he's done, that's where Jack Brewer is. Jack, it's a pleasure to have you on this show. I've enjoyed spending time with you over the last few years. Tell me how you ended up on the NFL professional football rosters growing up in Grapevine, Texas. And what was your biggest motivation to play professional football? Well, Lou, um, you know, when you, when you start talking about my biggest motivation and making it to the National Football League, there's, there's only one place that that came from, and that's, that's my dad. Uh, I had a father who uh, really instilled um, my passion. I mean, he coached me from the time uh, I was three years old. I mean, the earliest pictures that I have, you know, I have footballs in my hand. And uh, I remember my first season of tackle football when I was six years old. Um, you know, my dad put me out there and he always put the ball in my hand, uh, but he never let me come off the field. Uh, and so I had to play offense and defense and if there was a big play uh, that needed to be made, I mean, he he literally, Lou, he grabbed me old school. He grabbed me by my chest. He pulled me to him, and he said, hey, I need you to go make a play. And he throw me out there. And, you know, those things instilled um, a fearlessness in me uh, and really a, a, a passion to want to wanna be in that big game, want to be in that big moment. Uh, and as an undersized guy, a small guy, um, you know, I, I throughout my whole career, you know, I, I reached back to those moments, you know, weighing 190 pounds, playing in the NFL at safety and having to go in on special teams and, and hit a wedge. You know, you, you got to have that, that fearless mentality, and that definitely came from my father. Well, you know, what's really amazing, Jack, is you credit your father. And unfortunately, there's so many young black athletes today and people that don't have a father in their home and don't have the leadership that they truly did. And that was the purpose of this show, was to illustrate how other people played such a prominent role in our life, including your father. Now, how did your parents impact you, your growth and journey into college and professional football? Because, you know, you're at home, that's one thing. But you're away from home and you have the ups and the downs. How did you stay in touch with them? How did they continue to guide you through these difficult times, Jack? You know, I always wonder, like, especially with my mom, I don't know, I don't know how she put up with me half the time. Um, you know, I, I had my first child, Lou, when I was 19. 
And so my mom had to literally be my crutch um, between picking up my kids on the weekends and bringing them to me. And she was really my go between in every way. Um, And I know that uh, in the back of her mind, her passion was to make sure that I was successful and to make sure that, you know, I live my dreams and and accomplish everything that God had had set for, for, for me. And so, you know, she was a woman who she's a devout Christian. I mean, she was she'd be on her knees praying 30 45 minutes at a time when i walked by her room uh and so you know every time i get hurt on the football field she literally run out with blessed oil and start blessing me <laughs> and bless the team i mean that's the type of that's the type of mom i have you know and so you know when you have that type of of, of, of prayer over you and background and in home you know you want to be accountable to her um you want to make sure that that you don't do anything uh that that you know, disappoints her and you want to make her proud. And so she was really kind of my spiritual guide. And so as I kind of went through my life, um, you know, all those principles and, and those those godly uh, principles that she taught me uh, have really, you know, made me into the man that I am today. And so I give her a lot of credit for, for one, putting up with me, but uh, also being able to instill that, that spirituality in me. So that I, I had a fear of God, you know, there was a certain certain things I just wasn't going to do. Uh, and, you know, and that came from my mom. Well, I could say the same thing about my mother, but my father was in the Pacific for five years from age seven to 12, which are the formative years. But my mother was very, very religious. I've heard you pray and preach many times. What has really been the motivating factor for your strong faith in God? You know, you know, after, you know, obviously with my mom and and, and after, you know, growing up in a in a church in a place where, you know, as a young boy, I was the leader in the church. You know, I was uh, always taking the lead on whether it was, you know, Easter Sunday or choir or, you know, activities with the youth ministry. Uh, I've always been that person. And uh, I think once I, you know, dedicated my life to God and and really to serving everyone else, serving others. you know, that just came to fruition. And, and Lou, I tell you, man, when I go out into the inner cities and when I see particularly things that we were able to do with America First Policy Institute, you know, the things that I'm able to do with the Jack Brewer Foundation, when I start populations of fatherless kids, um, that's really um, the motivation behind my ministry. Uh, and that's really what we seek out to do is this, you know, the American dream is is really uh, a dream that's founded in God and principles of God. And so when you have populations that are born uh, in the situations that they have no control over, but yet, you know, keep them from the American dream and, and really pursuing great God's greatness that he's made us all uh, to be able to achieve, it's, it's heartbreaking. You know, I hate seeing those, you know, young kids that don't have dads throwing them a football or, you know, or being lied to. Uh, about, you know, all of these, you know, things, whether it's the, the gender confusion or telling them um, that evil is good and good is evil. Uh, you know, that breaks my heart, man. And so I, I try to preach into that and speak into that uh, and do whatever I can to give all these kids an opportunity to at least pursue the same dreams that I had a chance to pursue. Tell us about your foundation, Jack, how you started, what its purpose is. And the good things you've done with it. Yeah, well, we started over 18 years ago. Um, I, I founded the Jack Brewer Foundation. And, um, you know, I, my passion really was to, to go into um, communities, um, underserved communities that had voiceless people uh, and give them a chance. I've always had a, a deep heart uh, to serve the most vulnerable. And I, I got that from my mom. Uh, and so when I founded the organization, I started off going into uh, inner city areas in, in, in Minnesota where I was playing. Um, in the National Football League, uh, and then we quickly expanded across the country. And um, currently, we have over 50 orphanages in Africa. Uh, we we feed about 5,000 kids a day there. Uh, I've taken numerous trips to Africa. Can you introduce yourself? Give Hi, us your my name, name is uh, Roy. I am the managing director of the foundation. This this the foundation runs um, this school here, and uh, another one in uh, in a different district and um, several orphanages in that district, several orphanages in that district as well. The situation of orphans in Malawi is that we have 1.2 million orphans. And out of those, 15% are living in child or elderly-headed households. 
And so that's my, that's the Jewish Panda Foundation, Foundation's target. Looks like all the students have just finished their classes. Hi. I would like to welcome our visitors. We have Jack Brewer and Perry. And Perry. We have come to visit us. Jack Brewer is our sponsor for especially those on scholarship. So here he has come to meet you. Spent a lot of time there on the ground helping with um, economic development, food security. I have kids who are forced to drink dirty water, who you know have bacterial and waterborne diseases uh, that we're treating. Uh, and so we have uh, a full team of nurses, we have teachers, we have everything on the ground there. Uh, and that's just been a blessing to be able to help so many of those poor people. Uh, we also do a lot of work in Haiti. Haiti's a place where uh, I went for the first time after the earthquake in 2010, uh, dedicated a big part of my life there. Jack Brewer again, Jack Brewer Foundation. Um, we're here in Haiti. I don't know, I'm just so joyous right now. I actually just got a chance to um, evacuate one of my neighbors. Man, God is so good uh, to see that woman's face and, and to see that a kid's face. Woman's been stuck for 24 days they're just visiting and she walks off the plane and, and, and they're my neighbor in Parkland. They're going, taking their kids back to Parkland. If you're not living to serve somebody else, um, you don't have the true feeling of Jesus. We helped um, build an orphanage in, in, a, in a church there. Uh, and so we do a lot of work in, in that community. I partner with sports organizations on the ground. We feed um, uh, over a thousand kids a day there. Uh, between our different programs that we support. And so that's also been a blessing. Um, uh, but but Lou here has, has been, you know, one of our, our biggest challenges, and that's taking on this fatherless issue that we have. Uh, I started to go and, and teach into the prisons and jails uh, almost seven years ago. Uh, and as I started to go into these prisons, I started to realize the connection between the fatherlessness crisis uh, and really the root cause of, of why these men were locked up in prison, not going to these prisons to teach. Glory to God, I'm at South Bay Correctional with my brother Derek, uh, and he just told me an amazing story uh, that I wanted him to share with everybody to understand the significance uh, of our fatherhood program and how it's really impacting families. Derek, you wanna share that story with me? Yes, um, a few what it was, months ago, we filled out a distribution form for our families to receive food. I did one for my wife and her kids. And at that moment, they had no meat in their freezer and stuff. When the Brewer Foundation called out of nowhere with a surprise for them, saying, look, we got this food to deliver. And they were shocked once the box was delivered. And not only did they deliver it, they walked it up to the door. How does it make you feel to be in here knowing that you're still doing work to provide for your family? Oh, it made me feel good. And my kids, they were so surprised that they didn't expect that because they like, oh, you were in prison. How was you able to do this? And I'm like, well, it's people that's working with us, such as the Jack Brewer Foundation, that's helping us connect with our families and stuff. So that's why I'm able to do such things. And um, they was like, thank you. And my wife was like, man, let you know if you got a job, she want to come work and, and help out as much as she can and stuff. She like, they all, they just never heard of it until that came about. So I really appreciate it. They appreciate it. So, Well, thank you. That's what we're here for. And people like Derek are here working hard to get back to their, their family. Uh, and remember, that's our mission. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. God bless you. You know, when I'd ask them if they had kids, some of them have five, six, seven kids. And so those are five or six or seven kids that don't have a dad that are really um, being punished for a crime they didn't commit that their father committed. And so you started to see that these kids were the ones getting in trouble. These kids were the ones that had low reading and math proficiency levels. No one was talking about them. Uh, and so we really started making uh, a, a effort uh, at putting together full services for this population. And currently we're in about 12 prisons uh, here in the state of Florida. Uh, we have over a thousand people in our program and, and quickly growing. We'll be at uh, 20 prisons um, by the end of the year. 
Uh, and so now we have full wraparound services. Uh, we distribute about 100,000 pounds of food um, every month uh, here in Florida to these communities that are impacted by the criminal justice system. We have full classes. We have teachers. Uh, we have a, a, a staff of uh, uh, about 30 full-time, part-time, and volunteers. This community in particular has been really impacted by the criminal justice system. Uh, I've met countless moms and countless uh, uh, girlfriends and kids uh, who have dads incarcerated, fathers incarcerated, uncles incarcerated. And so uh, it's really important that the Jack Brewer Foundation and all of our uh, in custody programs uh, through the Hero Second Chance Fatherhood Initiative, it's important that we touch these communities because uh, it's really it's about that 300 and 60 degree wraparound services, that family unification, where we're actually helping some of these kids and some of these mothers go into the prison and visit their father. Uh, and also helping those fathers feel like they're still a part of their kids' lives. And so across the state of Florida, uh, we really need to continue to push this. Uh, the Jack Brewer Foundation right now uh, has expanded to nine counties uh, where we offer these services. And so we're just extremely excited uh, to be able to try to help do our part to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And so continue to keep us in your prayers as we do our work inside of prisons and in, in jails across this country, uh, and particularly in the state of Florida where we have over 2.5 million fatherless kids. And so keep us in your prayers, guys. This is uh, the civil rights issue of our time. Uh, we have to continue to work for the family um, in giving glory and honor to God. Thank you. And so our organization has really grown. But I think more importantly, uh, we're setting an example that if you um, give services to these populations, um, that you you can give these these kids um, that platform uh, to be able to pursue the American dream. Uh, we're, we're a conservative organization. We don't back back away from God. We don't back away from our love for country uh, and we don't back back down from conservative values. Well. Your what you've done has been fantastic, but how do you finance it all? I mean, yeah, you you just sort of glide over all this. Yeah, we feed this many. It doesn't just happen. It isn't like the man that comes down from heaven. Yeah, right. How do you do it? How do you handle it all? Uh, you know, it's 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 rough, man. I uh, so I, one part of my background I didn't go into, Lou, is when I was in the National Football League. I I had my master's degree before I went to the NFL. Um, so as I, the, literally the day I left and, and retired and sent my letter of retirement in that very Monday, that Monday, uh, I was working on wall street at, at, at Merrill Lynch. And so uh, I love finance. I've owned a number of businesses. And for me, uh, I try to run my organization as a business, um, making sure that, um, uh, you know, we're able to, to get donors, we're able to do things that are sustainable, not just spending money without, uh, being able to do different sustainable projects. And so we've been able to do that. We also uh, receive funding from a few uh, different state agencies and organizations that we receive. And we have a lot of individual donors who uh, really, really are, are passionate about our cause. They don't know how to, to help. They don't know how to go in and help the fatherless, or they don't know how to go in and and help the orphans themselves, but they see that we're doing the work hands on, and 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 they and they donate to us, and so uh, it's been a blessing. It's a lot. I mean, I work a lot, a lot of hours, a lot of late nights. Um, you know, I do a lot of my own contracts. I work with my different lawyers and accountants, and you know, I don't have the infrastructure um, that a huge organization would have, uh, but I'm able to navigate some of that using my background in finance. Uh, and some of the other um, experiences that I've had in the business world. And so it's been a blessing. Uh, you know, we, we, we do as much as we can. And, and, you know, honestly, I leverage myself a lot. So, uh, you know, if, if we come up short, you know, I, I usually try to chip in as much as I can uh, to make sure that we, we, we keep the ministry going. Well, we will keep that thing going. Now, Jack, Florida passed great legislation on fatherhood. fatherhood. But I know that you strongly support. Tell me how this will impact the people of Florida and your work in particular. Well, you know, I, I give I give a lot of credit to Governor DeSantis um, and the entire Florida legislature. You know, 
Uh, we had a fatherhood bill that passed here in the state of Florida that was unanimous. I think it was 117 to zero. Governor DeSantis has now signed a bill creating the Responsible Fatherhood Initiative, an effort to help dads get active in their kids' lives. The bill will provide $70 million in funding for programs that aim to equip fathers with parenting resources as well as help foster children. News for Jack's reporter Brianna Andrews joins us. And Brianna, several local nonprofit organizations may be eligible for grants through this new program. That's right. The Prisoners of Christ organization helps ex-offenders get a second chance at life. Now, I spoke to the head of the organization. He says that a lot of the resources that they have in place actually help these men reconnect with their family members. The Responsible Fatherhood Initiative is designed to solve what Governor Ron DeSantis calls a fatherhood crisis in Florida. If you look over the last many decades, uh, one of the worst social trends uh, has been the decline of fatherhood. And we do have, in many instances, a, a fatherhood crisis in this country. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 18.4 million children or one in four kids live without a biological step or adopted father in the home. The president of Prisoners of Christ says most of the inmates come from broken homes. When they tell you their stories or kind of how they got into trouble, do they ever mention, you know, lack of a father presence? You know, how often do you hear, you know, that's why I chose this path or did it not play a role at all? It's the outlier and the unusual event to have both parents in the family when we deal with somebody who's been incarcerated. Prisoners of Christ helps ex-offenders find employment and rebuild family relationships once they're out of prison. Witt says funding programs like these are necessary to create better family dynamics. A ministry like this who helps an ex-offender also helps children. They are connected. The whole, all of society is connected. Here's a breakdown of what the Responsible Fatherhood Initiative does. 32.6 million goes towards grants aimed at assisting fathers. It will support and create mentoring programs through the Department of Juvenile Justice for at-risk youth. Through the Department of Children and Families, it creates a statewide awareness campaign about the importance of responsible fatherhood. And DCF will support groups that use evidence-based parenting education to help fathers stay engaged. It also increases a stipend for young adults who were in foster care and are now attending post-secondary school. The Republicans and Democrats came together um, with to support this bill. I mean, it's this, you know, I feel it's the unifying issue of our country. Uh, if people could get over um, all the, the political um, mudslinging and, you know, the victim kind of the kind of the victim mentality and just say, hey, let's focus on these kids and these fatherless kids and that dads matter. You know, we need dads in the home to 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 help keep these boys straight. And so that's what this legislation has done. Uh, it's empowered organizations uh, across the state of Florida to really focus on these fatherless kids. Um, you know, there it's one thing to spend money, but how are you spending money? Spend the money on the things that matter that can impact our communities. You know, we, we talk about criminal justice reform, but you don't talk about getting to the root cause of why the kids are going to end up in prison in the first place. Um, you talk about poverty reduction, but you're not talking about, you know, having work programs and vocational programs that are going to help these men get out of prison. We want to talk about, you know, how we're going to let more illegal immigrants come across the border. But those same crimes, we lock up men that are citizens here for 10, 15, 20 years. But illegals, we just let them out. So Lake and Riley's murderer was in custody, in law enforcement custody, and he was released without notification to ICE, to federal authorities, because of policies and laws passed by Democrats here in New York State. It really is that simple. And so we got to fix the injustices, the real injustices that we have in our country, instead of focusing on all of this political mudslinging uh, and political fundraising. And so my organization tries to get to the root cause of that, um, really with the programs on the ground versus just talking about these things, um, you know, without having solutions. And so we're a solution based approach. Uh, and I think that's what fatherhood, the fatherhood bill here in the state of Florida does that it addresses the root cause. And I think we can do that same thing across the country. I, I could agree with you more. I've often said this, Jack, I don't care what you accomplish in this world. 
If you aren't successful as a husband and a father, you've really failed. And the greatest obligation you have, you bring a child in this world to give them every chance to possibly be successful. Tell me about your four children. Oh, my four children have been uh, really uh, an educational <laughs> uh, experience for me. You know, I started so young, Lou, 19, and now I'm 45, and I got a six-year-old. And so I got about a 20-year gap between it. Uh, I'm a grandfather now for the first time, which is an amazing feeling that I never uh, thought I'd have. Uh, and didn't realize how that would feel. And so, you know, my kids are, have, have been amazing. Um, start with my oldest son, Jared. He's overcome a lot. He was born with sickle cell uh, anemia and had a lot of health problems oh as, as a youth. Yeah, and he's kind of grown through that. Um, and really, um, you know, that, that's that been a true blessing just to see him, you know, first off, be healthy and and, and, and get, his, get his health back together. And so that's been a blessing for us. My daughter Laisha, uh, she's been incredible to see her progress uh, over the over the years, especially the last few years. Um, uh, she's 24 now. Uh, she's a, a, a very successful model, uh, and she also now works for the foundation. Has really helped uh, steer our fundraising, our um, our marketing. Um, you know, she's a a, a beautiful girl um, who. Uh, has used her talents to, to to help serve a lot of different people. So I'm extremely proud of her. And my two youngest, Jackson, is my youngest son. He's 11, and he's really one that keeps me running. I think he he, he met you, Coach. He's been able to to, to meet you, and um, you know he's a pretty good baseball player. And so I, I coach him, and and, and he kind of keeps me busy. Uh, and then my six year old daughter, um, you know, she runs the house, and we just. You know, try to <laughs> we are try yeah. to make sure that she stays uh, happy. But my kids are, are amazing. God has really blessed me with a beautiful family, and, and my wife, uh, who's so supportive. You know, really, we all work towards the same goal, and that's you know, we work towards the fatherless and helping them and serving them. We have a a house that believes um, in serving and putting our words to action, uh, and not just talking about it, but doing something to help our brothers and sisters. So. The spirit of service uh, is alive and, and well in the Brewer home, uh, and that's really what we're founded on. Well, fatherhood is deeply rooted in biblical foundations. Can you expand on this? Definitely. You know, if you if you read if you read scripture and, and you and you see um, the great men, you know, it, it's always uh, goes back to the father. Uh, if you read the last scripture in the Old Testament, it says. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And so people, some people get scared when you talk about curses and you talk about evil and good. But I mean, if you if you really look at it, that's what we're seeing. You, you're seeing a curse on our land uh, when we have our prisons and jails. We're the most uh, incarcerated country. We're the most fatherless country. Uh, and so we've we've made it acceptable for a man not to have to take care of their children. The United States of America incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. In fact, the U.S. hosts more prison inmates than all other developed nations combined. In 2010, the U.S. was home to about 309 million people, 4.5% of the world's total population, but housed 23% of the world's prisoners. And we've also made it acceptable uh, for a woman not to expect to be married to the man um, that she raised a family with. And so all those things are broken. Those, those things go against uh, the Bible. Uh, and, and, I, and I think we're, we're experiencing uh, some of the results of that now. And we you know, turn on our TV and we say, oh, they're looting. Uh, oh, we see they're, they're going into stores and stealing, all the, <laughs> stealing from, from stores and they're making sure they keep it under $1,000. We see uh, uh, people just um, you know, assaulting police officers, Legals come across the border. These people are fatherless. They don't have a hard-handed dad. There's no way I would be running around the streets and let on TV letting people see me steal from a store, uh, knowing that my dad would put would put his foot in my butt when I got home. <laughs> <laughs> so there's just it wouldn't even cross my mind to run around and act like that. And so uh, I I think that's what we've lost. And I think the Bible. Uh, tells us that over and over again um, that, you know, fatherhood uh, is important. And, you know, our father, which art in heaven, Jesus came to set an example for us all. Uh, and, and he died for our sins. 
Uh, Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I think our fathers need to realize that we are here to sacrifice for our family. Uh, we're, we are here to, to, get, to be that example uh, of Christ, but not just for the world, for our family first. Uh, and so if we don't do that and we don't take on that obligation, we will um, experience some of the ills that we're seeing across our society uh, that, that's really, you know, leaving a stain on our country. Uh, and I think if we could, as a nation, get back to focusing on fatherhood, uh, I think we could reestablish, um, you know, so many of the great things that our, that our, our founding fathers and those that came after them uh, worked so hard and died for. Jack, you've been very bold. Uh, about your political and policy beliefs. What's giving you the courage and the strength to speak out when so many people are intimidated because they might get criticized? How do you keep that going? Man, Lou, I, I, I think it, a lot of it comes from my football. You know, being, you know, I played for Tom Coughlin, you know, Andy Reid, uh, John Harbaugh, Denny Green, uh, uh, Glenn Mason, I played for some great men who were fearless leaders. And so, you know, the boldness that it took for me to run down when, when my coach would tell me to go make a tackle inside the 20 uh, when we needed a big play, that's the same boldness I, I, I bring to the table when you start talking about politics. You see, some people try to, to take politics and split it up from religion or split it up from this and feelings and not around your family. I, politics controls all of that. And so religion and, and politics uh, go hand in hand. This constitution won't work the way we are teaching children. And I'd give you the rest of my time to elaborate on that. Thank you, Mr. Gomer. I mean, I have been working on these issues with my hands for a long time. My question is how many of the folks behind that uh, in Congress have actually been in the prisons actively and going to the inner cities actively so for me to be called, my ideas to be called idiocy uh, and to be made a mockery of uh, in front of the nation, you know, I know that I'm taking that persecution in the name of Jesus because we, I hear a lot of flesh talk. I don't hear any spirit talk. Spirit talk says that we cannot solve things of the flesh with the flesh. The things of the spirit must come in. When you pull a trigger and mass shoot somebody, you are spiritually weak. And for us to sit here as we look and see that 82% of people that commit mass shootings are fatherless. To not look at that as a root cause to me is idiocy. And so when we start talking about our kids, look at what's happening in our public schools. A lot of our public schools, kids are reading three and four grade levels below their proficiency. They don't have dads at home to hold them accountable. And so to say that that doesn't play in to why we have so much gun violence in our streets makes no sense. Go into the prisons and talk to the people who are pulling the trigger. I am here speaking for them because I serve them every day. And the reason, the only way that they rehab is through the word of God. We don't teach God in our schools anymore. We don't even teach the Ten Commandments. Most kids don't even know the Ten Commandments. And so they don't have a fear of God. If you don't have a fear of God, there is no way that you are going to be able to go into a society and, and promote any type of righteousness. We are morally weak as a nation right now, and I think we put that front and center for the American people to see that we have certain people in our government that do not want to stand up for the word of God. That is called the Antichrist, and I yield back, Mr. Gomer. Thank you. I can't, I can't vote for things that are not godly or people that are not godly and going to push godly policies. I can't vote for people that, that are going to push these type of things and not allow for um, you know, godly principles for our children and then say I'm a Christian or say I'm aligned with righteousness. I got I to gotta be real with what I'm doing. And, and, and some of these things that are happening right before our eyes, we all know they're not right. We see what they're doing to these kids, split, splitting these kids up between skin color and doing all of these. Come on. We, we are better as a nation than that. And so if you're voting for these people, then you got a price to pay. And so for me, as a, especially as a black man, right, because we have a Democratic Party that has lied and cheated the black community. We have cities 
um, that are the worst run, dirtiest cities, the, the worst education systems in the country. All of them are democratically run. Every single one of them. Well, it's no secret that crime, homelessness, and lawlessness has gripped many Democrat-run American cities, leaving once great metropolises looking like war zones or sets from apocalyptic zombie movies. Right now, Chicago is in the headlines after local youths went on a rampage, looting stores, vandalizing streets, and beating up anyone who happened to get in their way. Stunning find findings on Baltimore schools. Tell me. It's depressing. 33 high schools in Baltimore administered the state math exam in the spring. In 13 of those 33, not one student tested proficient in math. Not one. So for me to sit back here as a Christian black man and say that, uh, I'm okay with that because the folks that are running the the the, the uh, city are black. Then I'm being a racist. I mean, so I mean, at some point we got to keep it real uh, with ourselves and, and call it what it is. Um, these liberal policies are literally destroying this country, uh, and it, and it is exacerbating the fatherlessness crisis. It's exacerbating poverty. It's exacerbating sexualization of kids. I mean, all of these things are being exacerbated um, by liberal policies. And enough is enough. If you're not speaking out, you're a coward. I agree with you, Jack. About half the athletes I've coached in college and that were. Afro-American minorities. And when I come to this conclusion, talent is equally distributed around the world. What happens when things come your way? You gotta be able to have the opportunity. That's the obligation we have. Now, as we get ready to wrap this up, the theme of my show, Jack, is coaching America back to greatness. What do you believe needs to be done to restore the culture of this country, and also, Jack, how can the listeners who are watching this show contribute to your foundation to make a difference? Because I know the good work that you do, and I'd love to help you, and I'm sure other people, and I ask, I beg you, you're watching this, you care about American greatness, help Jack and the other people. So what would you say as we wrap this up? What is the most important thing by coaching America back to greatness and restoring the culture of this country. You know, <clears throat> Coach Holtz, as I mentioned before, uh, the coaches that I played for and men like yourselves um, were so valuable um, in teaching me my foundational principles. And I think we need to get back to that as a country um, because truth has been lost, right? The definition of love has been lost. I know my coach loved me. I know Coach Mason loved me. I know uh, uh, Coach Harbaugh loved me. Uh, I know all the men that I played for loved me, but yet they would scold me. If I did, if I messed up, they'd get in my face. They, they run me. They, they make me come and, and, and spend extra time in the meeting room. They held me accountable. And I think this nation has lost um, the acceptance of accountability, and we've started to confuse what the definition of love is and when and, uh, love has to have accountability because accountability is the only way you will have truth uh and so i think as 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 you say coaching america back to greatness we need to take the examples of, of a coach and we have to be coachable uh there was no better uh comment that i ever received from my coaches but every single coach i played for said i was coachable uh, and being coachable means that you're humble enough uh, to listen to correction, accept correction, uh, and expect greatness of yourself. Uh, and so uh, right now we have so many emotions and feelings that come into play with every category across politics and culture and life. Uh, and we need to get away from that. We need to humble ourselves. We need to be willing to be coachable. Uh, and, and we need to, to understand that true love comes with dis discipline uh, and accountability. What I've always said, discipline is what you do to somebody. Discipline is what you do for somebody. And people have to learn the difference between right and wrong and make good choices. How do you make good choices? By stop making bad choices as we go along. <laughs> but, but Jack, it's been wonderful having you. You're a great guest, but your achievements is great. And I hope people listening will get in touch with you and try to help you 
as you bring America back to greatness. Thank you for having us. But more importantly, thanks for all the difference you make in people's lives. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. And, and if anybody wants to reach us, it's the Jack Brewer Foundation dot org, the Jack Brewer Foundation dot org. Um, we 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 just we thank God for for people like you, Lou, and and uh, really all the Americans that have poured in us. We've had over twenty five hundred donors donors to, that have come in to help us. And so it's just it's just a blessing. I'm humbled by it. Uh, and I can promise you this, just like I was on the football field. I'm that small, undersized scrappy kid from texas uh who had a daddy that put a lot of fire in me and i'm gonna fight for this country i tell you that i'm with you don't tell me how rocking the sea is just bring the doggone ship in period <laughs> that's all <laughs> have a great day and thank you again jack thank you brother and he walks away after winning his 100th game as the head coach here at notre dame the reason I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I was born in this country. It isn't what you have, it's what you're taught about the values of life. We trying to save souls. See, there's a rule of life, but then you're either growing or you're dying. And like an old friend once said, we as Americans need to start winning again. Everyone should ask this question. Am I willing to endure the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice it takes to be a champion?